Naomi, uh, Naomi Klein is, uh, there's a big, you know, this U- University of California uh, divested and from, it has something like a $14 billion endowment and a $70 billion pension. I mean, the University of California system, it's pretty big, obviously. But you're talking about a total of like, I don't know, what, $83 billion, somewhere around there? Maybe yeah, 80, $84 billion. And they are divesting their holdings of anything involving fossil fuels, both because it's becoming a risky proposition to invest in fossil fuels because everyone knows the future is coming and fossil fuels cannot be part of it. But it's also because they want to make sure that the future comes and 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 that uh, and divesting her. This is a big deal because the argument that you're putting at risk a pension by not uh, owning oil stocks, or you're putting at risk an endowment by not owning coal stocks, fracking stocks, or whatever it is, is hard to make when you've got an eighty billion dollar fund that is willing to to divest in that way. That's a big deal. And uh, Bill McKibben at uh, uh, 350.org, I think he's still there, um, has been working on this for four or five years. There were people at the end of the Obama administration who were getting arrested uh, for this type of divestment. It is, in some ways, um, this uh, divestiture movements brought about the changes in South Africa, at least to the extent that America played a role in it. it was largely because companies were finding that doing business in South Africa was beginning to hurt their stock values. And so they basically uh, went to South Africa and said, like, this is not sustainable. And um, I guess I'm getting a little sentimental of a divestiture talking to Billy Bragg today. But also, um, uh, Naomi Klein uh, has a new book out. Uh, she was on Democracy Now! Uh, talking about the um, what is happening with the climate movement, and particularly um, in this uh, segment, um, some of the dangers that are represented, as we saw with the um, El Paso shooter, um, referencing a diminishing amount of resources, and therefore that justifies us throwing some people overboard. I, I write about the, the Christchurch killer, um, in part because that horrific attack, which stole the lives of more than 50 people in New Zealand at two mosques, um, happened on March 15th. And that day is significant for, for many reasons. One of them is that that was the day of the first global youth climate strike. Um, that is the day that 1.6 million young people around the world walked out of class um, and, and, to, and, and took this stand for international solidarity with children all around the world. Um, It really, a a movement that is in no way nationalist, right, Um, that is calling for justice at the center of our response to the climate crisis. In in, in, uh, Christchurch, the student strike, the rally after the student strike um, was disrupted, and, and the students were told to disperse because there was a live shooting just a few blocks away at the mosque, and that was um, the killing that I referred to earlier. And one of the things that was um, really different about that attack, and he did take inspiration from all of these um, different uh, mass murderers. Um, was that he? This killer identified as an eco-fascist. That he said that in his manifesto, wrote that in his manifesto, talked about how immigrants were destroying Europe, destroying you know the Christian world, and so on. Um, and you know, I think there's been a lot of focus in uh, recent years about how do we change the minds of the climate deniers, right? Um, I think the only thing scarier than uh, a far-right racist movement that denies the reality of climate change is a far-right racist movement that doesn't deny the reality of climate change. Um, I mean, there you have it. It's, I mean, it, 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 if anything, the the idea that this is being cited across, you know, from, uh, you know, the lunatics, uh, fascists on the right, 
um, just give you a uh, rise to the, the reality of this uh, uh, of its existence and the idea that we still have the only major significant maybe the only but certainly the only significant political party in the world which is organized around the principle that and I'm not exactly sure where they are at this point that either climate change is a hoax or just simply not there's nothing we can do about it just get it God will take care of it well, or as some in in, uh, in Silicon Valley, um, they're actually planning for those scenarios and buying eco bunkers and building scenarios for them. Well, at least they're aware. They're, but they at, at least, least acknowledge no, that it's that, happening. That, that's true, but I think that's the correlation of the of the point I just want to make. That that of course it's important to to acknowledge or accept or whatever we're going to use the science of it but that's not the uh you know the trick that a that's lot a sticking of, point it's a political question and ultimately as the right wing quote unquote accepts the science if the politics is still maximalist and apartheid no it's gonna that's how it's going to turn right. into it's going to turn into and, mass deaths and this is what achila bimbe again i always cite that piece the age of humanism is ending which he wrote before 2016 and all of the dynamics are here and that's exactly the point. And that's an, and it also correlates with the viciousness and racism towards refugees, because yeah. a lot of refugees are eco refugees and also internally in countries as well. So you need to deal with the politics. The science is a second order question. Yeah. And this is not new, by the way. There is a long history of people on the far right taking an interest, however disingenuously, in the environment. I don't think it's disingenuous. Like some of the... The, the Hitler, well, the Well, Heidegger. then you look at where their money is invested, and it's in fossil fuel companies. So, like, I, I listened to a really good episode of uh, Trillbilly Workers Party with uh, my friend Brendan O'Connor, where they talked a lot about all of the this, this web of connections, this element of the right that takes an interest in the environment and it's it's always been that way some of the early eugenics eugenics people were into environmentalism but i think it's going to catch on more and more as like you guys said people more people on the right accept the realities of climate change and as we see waves of migration that we know are going to be caused by climate change right. and the left needs to be ready with a real response to that we need to be making the case now for the free movement of people and we need to be making the case to the wider working class how this in fact benefits everyone and doesn't hurt us to let people in who want to come here yeah it's sort of a scary thought um oh just a reminder somebody just told me i did not uh say the name of the billy bragg book at the end of the interview the three dimensions of freedom we'll put a uh Put a link to obviously in the um, uh, the podcast description. I think Republicans started uh, unrolling their climate policy when Trump started saying "build the wall." Right. 